Also want to uh, welcome all of our first time guests with us. Thank you for being here. And if you're a first time guest, we'd love to connect with you. And so in front of you in your seats is what we call the ticket. And we would encourage you to take one, fill it out. And if you're a first time guest, when the service is over, my wife and I will be out in what we call the hub, out the doors to my left by the cafe. Bring it up to us. We'd love to meet you, connect with you, give you a gift. Our way of saying thanks for being a guest with us today. We also want to remind all of you, I, I, I want you to do me a favor this week. I'd like all of you to spend a little bit of time on our church website. Our church website is myefree.org, myefree.org. And on that website, you're going to find all the information for two very exciting things happening this month. One is the start of our small group semester, our M3 groups. All the groups are listed on the website. You can sign up right on the website. Also, coming up in just a little over a month is Night to Shine, one of the greatest nights of the year. It's a night in which we have a full-blown prom for individuals with special needs. It takes a lot of volunteers, a lot of buddies, you can get all the information by going to our website, myefree.org. So do me a favor, and this week, spend a little bit of time on that website, find out about our small groups, and find out about Night to Shine. Well, we want to welcome in all of our campuses, our Sault Ste. Marie campus. We welcome you, our online campus. We welcome groups that are watching this morning in Harbor Springs and Charlevoix at the Tall Timber Church down in Florida. We welcome our TV audience, our radio audience. No matter how you're tuning in today, we're glad that you're part of this special Sunday here at E-Free Church. Well, as we get started today, I want to um, start officially our series we're calling The Long Road Home. And over the past several years, we followed the life of the Apostle Paul from before he found Jesus through his third missionary journey. And now beginning today, and for the next 10 weeks, we're going to follow his life from the end of his third journey all the way through his death. He'll spend most of that time in prison. Now, before we get started this morning, I want to ask you two questions. They're would-you-rather questions, okay? Would-you-rather means you must choose one, but you can't choose both. You must choose one. You can't go, well, it depends. No, you must choose one. You can't choose both. And here they are. Question number one. Would you rather experience comfort or hardship? You have to choose one. You can't choose both. You can't say, well, it depends. Would you rather, just on the norm, would you rather experience comfort or would you rather experience hardship? That's a pretty easy one, isn't it? I think most of us would rather experience comfort. Here's the second one. Would you rather be surrounded by people who care about you or be surrounded by people who could not care less about you? Now, don't look at the person sitting next to you, all right? Would you rather be surrounded by people who really care about you, or would you rather be surrounded by people who could not care less about you? Well, that's an easy one too, isn't it? I mean, none of us go, man, I really hope this week I have interactions with nobody but people who don't like me. None of us do that. But here's the interesting thing. Though we would always choose comfort over hardship, and though we would always choose people who care about us over people who could not care less about us, what we're going to discover today in the life of the Apostle Paul is that there will be two forces that try to keep him from following God's will. And those two forces are, number one, comfort, and number two, believe it or not, people who really cared about him. So we're going to see two words to describe the Apostle Paul this morning. In the first part of the message, we're going to see the word determination. And in the second part of the message, we're going to see the word humility. And together we're going to learn how those can apply to our lives as we start this new year. So I want to begin reading in Acts 21. Now before I do, let me set the stage. 
Back in Acts chapter 19 and chapter 20, God has made it very clear to the Apostle Paul that he is to go to Jerusalem. His third journey is over. He is to go to Jerusalem. God has made that clear. In fact, in Acts chapter 20, I think it's verse 22, Paul says, the Spirit of God constrains me to go to Jerusalem. What does it mean to constrain? Well, it's the opposite of restraint. When I restrain somebody, I keep them from doing it. When I constrain someone, I push them to do it. And he says, the Holy Spirit of God is pushing me to what? To go to Jerusalem. So I want you to keep that in mind. Paul knows God's will for his life, if he's going to follow it, is to go to Jerusalem. Now, he's going to learn, and he already knows this, he's going to see it more and more, that as he gets there, there's going to be great hardship. It is not going to be an arrival of comfort, but rather an arrival, a destination of hardship. So keep that in mind as I begin reading in Acts 21. We're starting verse number 3. The first couple of verses just give us some of the travel of Paul. We pick it up in verse 3 where it says, when we came, Luke is writing, Luke is with him. When we came in sight of the island of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we kept sailing to Syria and we landed at Tyre. Now the city of Tyre would be in modern day Lebanon. And there it says the ship had to unload its cargo. Now they didn't have equipment to do that back then and so it took a while. So it says, after looking up the disciples, followers of Jesus that are in Tyre, we stayed there seven days. But that's how long it took for the ship to unload its cargo so it could go again. Now look at the last phrase. He's there for seven days, and these disciples, these followers of Jesus, kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. Now here is some individuals who truly care about Paul. And God, through the Spirit, has revealed to them that hardship awaits Paul in Jerusalem. And it would appear that they've interpreted that as, we need to convince Paul not to go. And for seven days, it says, they kept telling Paul not to go. So all through the seven days, they're trying to convince him. Every morning at breakfast, Paul, you shouldn't go. It's going to be bad. Every day at lunch, Paul, you should not go. It's going to be bad. Every day at dinner, Paul, you should not go to Jerusalem. It's going to be bad. And this is beginning to weigh on Paul. Paul knows God's will is for him to go to Jerusalem, but he's facing some adversity. One adversity is the constant reminder that there's not going to be any comfort. There's going to be great hardship. And people who really care about him, who are trying to convince him not to go. But Paul has determination. Paul is determined to follow God's will, even if it means giving up comfort. And God is determined, Paul is determined to follow God's will, even if it means going against the advice of people who care about him. So seven days later, He's going to travel again. And as we pick up the story in verse number 10, he has landed in Caesarea. That'll be the last stop before he goes to Jerusalem. And here's what it says in verse 10 of Acts 21. And as we, Luke says, because again, Luke is with him, as we were staying there in Caesarea for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And we'll talk about who Agabus was in just a moment. And coming to us, here's what Agabus did. He took Paul's belt off of him. That would have been kind of like the sash used to tie his robe shut. He took Paul's belt, and he used Paul's belt, and Agabus bound it around his own feet and his hands. And then he said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way the way that I have been bound by this belt, by my hands and feet. In this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And at this point, Paul's got to be thinking, 
I really hope I accidentally picked up Luke's belt in the hotel this morning, right? Maybe it's not my belt I got. And people knows it is. So here's Agabus. Now, who's Agabus? Agabus was a very real prophet of God. In fact, back in Acts chapter 11, he correctly predicted the famine that took place in AD 46 under the reign of Emperor Claudius. And now Agabus uses a visual to demonstrate that God has revealed to him that if Paul goes to Jerusalem, he'll be arrested and handed over to the Gentiles. Now, you may read that and go, wow, that, why did he have to visualize it? Well, to be honest with you, if you want to do a fascinating study sometime, I mean a study that will absolutely fascinate you, go through the Old Testament. And look at all the times the prophets of God used visuals to share what God told them. Because some of them are strange. Isaiah had to walk around naked for days. I'm glad I'm not an Old Testament prophet. And uh, you're probably even more glad I'm not an Old Testament prophet. But then there was another prophet that literally had to take dirty under, uh, dirty underwear and bury it in the ground and then later dig it up and show it to people. It's amazing. They're, they're there. Trust me, I'm not making it up. They're there. Do some research. It's fascinating. So here, Agabus uses a visual. Now, once again, what's Paul faced with? Right up close and personal, he is being reminded that if I go to Jerusalem, even though God has called me to do that, even though I know it's his will for my life, it's going to be tough that Paul will spend most of the rest of his life in prison. He will ultimately be beheaded. Now, that won't happen in Jerusalem, but it will happen in Rome. So what happens after Agabus makes this visual, yet very obvious, public prediction? Look at verse 12 and notice the pronoun. When we heard this, who's writing this? Luke. He's now talking about his, Paul's own traveling companions. When we... The traveling companions who are traveling with Paul, when we heard this, we, as well as all the other believers in Caesarea, the local residents, we began begging Paul, please don't go to Jerusalem. Now, I think part of the reason Luke and his companions were doing that was because of their concern and love for Paul, no doubt. But I got a funny feeling that part of it was a little bit selfish too. Because Luke's got to be thinking, okay, if we go with Paul to Jerusalem and they do really bad things to Paul in Jerusalem, chances are really good we're next on their list. So Paul, please don't go to Jerusalem. And they're all begging him, it says, pleading with him trying every source of emotion and guilt to keep Paul from going. So look now in verse 13 and notice Paul's determination. Paul is determined to follow God's will, even if it means hardship over comfort. He is determined to follow God's will, even if it means going against the, the advice and begging and longing of people who care about him. Look what he says in verse 13. Then Paul answered them and said, What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. In other words, why are you trying to convince me not to go? That word breaking, where it says breaking my heart, very interesting word. Because it's a word that was used to describe how women in that day would wash clothes. They would beat the clothes against a rock in order to get the dirt and the sand and the grime out of it. And Paul says, why are you beating my heart against a rock 
trying to get me to change? Why are you trying everything at your disposal to change my heart in desiring to follow the Lord's will? Paul is determined. He is determined to follow God's will, even if it goes against the well-meaning yet ill-advised counsel of people who care about him. And I have to stop and wonder how many followers of Jesus have chosen not to follow God's will for their life because well-meaning family members and friends thought it would be difficult for them and encourage them against doing it. Paul is determined to follow God's will, even if it means going against the wishes of people who truly cared about. And then he says this, for I am ready not only to be bound like Agabus said would happen to be arrested, but I'm ready even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So how do we see Paul's determination? He is determined to follow God's will no matter what hardship it brings in his life. I wonder how many times we have said no to the clear will of God because it would bring hardship into our lives. So after Paul says that, it says in verse 14, and since Paul would not be persuaded, we fell silent. And we said, the will of the Lord be done. Ladies and gentlemen, what is keeping you from following God's will for your life? Because you see, even if following God's will brings hardship, it is still the very best place you could be. And even if following God's will takes you opposite the longing of people who care about you. It's still the best place you can be. God's will for your life is never easy. Never. If it was easy to follow God's will, it would not take faith. But following God's will, even when it hurts, is worth it. How determined are you to follow God's will for your life? So, we see the determination of Paul. He and his companions set out for Jerusalem. And when they get to Jerusalem, we're now going to see the humility of Paul. And it begins with a celebration. That's how it begins. There's a celebration when he arrives. Let me read beginning in verse 17. After we arrived in Jerusalem, Luke says, the brethren received us. There was a group of believers, knew we were coming, waiting for us. They received us. And the following day, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders were present. I want to pause there. Before we get to the celebration, I want to pause there. Because I see two things there that are easy to just kind of glance over, but I think are worth noting. And the first one is this. Who is leading at this time the church in Jerusalem? James and the elders. Now, by the way, this is not James the Apostle. James the Apostle has already died. This is James, the half-brother of Jesus, who appears to be not just one of the elders, but maybe the head elder. But when Paul goes in to give this report, 
He doesn't give the report to Peter and John, the apostles. They're no longer leading the church. The church is now being led by elders. A transition has taken place. You see, Paul would later write that the apostles were the foundation of the church. You only laid the foundation once. And after it's laid, you build upon it. And now, leadership in the church has transitioned from the apostles leading the church to the elders leading the church, and it would remain that way through the rest of the New Testament. Paul would write about it often. So we see the transition to elder leadership in the church. But there's something else that just popped out to me this week that I thought was interesting. And so I share it with you just as kind of a sidebar. And it was this. Who was James? The half-brother of Jesus. They shared the same mom, Mary, right? And so here's Jesus, his church, right? And who's the leader of the most important local church in the region? A family member. His half-brother. Now what would we call that in today's society? Today we'd call it nepotism, right? And today nepotism is often looked down at. And, and, and make no mistake about it. When you hire a family member just because they're a family member, if I were to hire a family member on staff here at the church just because they're a family member, they're not really qualified for the job or certainly not the best qualified for the job, but because they're family, I hire them, that would be improper. However, it's very clear from this illustration that to say that you should never hire a family member is not correct. Because if that were the case, James would not have this position. To hire a family member because they are qualified, because they are the best person, nothing wrong with that. Now, by the way, that's not me paving the way to hire a family member. I have no family member who would ever want to work for me, so you don't have to worry about that. But, nepotism isn't always a bad thing. just thought that was interesting. All right, let's keep reading. It says, verse 19, after he had greeted them, Paul began to relate one by one the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. Now, notice a couple key phrases there. He did it one by one, and they were the things God had done, and he did them where? Among the Gentiles. So what does Paul report that causes the celebration? Well, one by one, he begins to suggest to them and report to them about all the many stories of victory that had taken place as he went through these journeys to all these Gentile churches. And by the way, that word one by one, that phrase literally means he hit every story specifically. This was a long report, okay? He went through every story, every story. He wanted them to see what God was doing outside of the Jewish world. He wanted them to see that the church wasn't just a Jewish thing, but God was working in miraculous ways among the Gentiles as well. And as he shared the stories, I love it. Here's what we see about his humility. Look at it. He shared one by one, verse 19 says, the things which God had done among the Gentiles through Paul's ministry. I love that. You see, as incredible as Paul was, as important as Paul was, as prestigious as people looked at him, Paul understood something. Only God can bring about spiritual fruit. Only God can bring about spiritual victory. It wasn't, let me tell you about all the things I did among the Gentiles. No, it was, let me tell you everything God did among the Gentiles. Can you imagine back when you were in school and you studied hard for a test and you picked up your pencil and you took the test and it just so happened you aced it? I mean, you got 100%. You didn't miss anything, right? Could you imagine if that happened and suddenly your teacher or your professor threw a party in honor of your pencil? What an incredible pencil. 
Did you see what that pencil did? That pencil scored 100% on the test. And you're going, that pencil didn't do a thing. I did all the study. I did all the work. That was just an instrument I used to fill in the dots. Folks, listen. As our, church is, as our church continues to grow and God continues to bless us, may we never forget this. You and I are nothing more than pencils. That's all we are. We're not doing anything. God is doing it, and we happen to have the privilege of being the pencils that he uses to grow his church. I love Paul's humility. It's amazing. And it says, as a result, they glorified God. And I'm sure part of this celebration was Paul giving them the offering that he had taken throughout all those Gentile churches for the hurting Jews in Jerusalem. But now, now this celebration takes a turn. And suddenly we go from a celebration to a concern. We now go from a great celebration to a concern that takes place. Now let me read beginning the end of verse 20. And they, that would be James and the elders, said to Paul, you see, brother Paul, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. Now that's a good thing, right? Paul, while you've been going on these journeys, thousands of Jewish people have put their faith in Jesus. They are trusting the death and resurrection of Jesus alone for their salvation. That's a beautiful thing. And they say, but there's something else you need to know about these thousands of Jewish people who are no longer trusting the law to get them to heaven, but are trusting faith in Jesus. And it's this. They are still zealous for the law. In other words, they're still committed to obeying the law. They still see the law as important. Their Jewish customs mean something to them. And though they are trusting in faith alone in Jesus to get them to heaven, they are still very zealous and committed to living by those law issues. The dietary laws, the feasts, the festival, the Sabbath. They're not living by them. They're not doing those things to get them to heaven. That's faith in Jesus alone but they see it as important to do that. So here's the problem, as we keep reading in verse 21. And they, who have put their faith in Jesus, but still see it as important to follow the Jewish customs, they have been told about you, that you're teaching that all Jews who are among the Gentiles should forsake Moses completely. That all Jews should quit having their children circumcised. All Jews should quit walking against the customs of the Jewish law. So there were enemies of Paul that were spreading this. Now, was that accusation true? No, not at all. In fact, if you remember from way back in our last study, Church on the Move, when we studied the third journey, Paul's desire was to be in Jerusalem in time to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. That was one of those Old Testament things. Paul wasn't against that. Not at all. That Paul, later on we'll find out, will encourage Timothy to get circumcised because it's good for their ministry. He's not against it. But there are some enemies of Paul who have convinced all these thousands of Jews that Paul is against the Jewish customs. And so it says in verse 22, what is to be done? Because they're going to hear that you're here, and when they hear that you're here, it's not going to be pretty. Paul, maybe you don't realize this. But your approval rating among believers in Jerusalem is at an all-time low. Well, maybe the only time it was lower is when you were actually trying to kill them. But since then, your approval rating here is pretty low. And we've got to do something about this. We have to do something so they know that's not true about you. You're not against the Jewish customs. So they come up with a conclusion. And the conclusion is found in verse 23. 
And here's where we're going to see great humility from Paul. Therefore, they say, do this that we tell you. Just stop for a second. I want you to see this humility. This is James and the elders looking at the apostle Paul and giving him a command. Here's what we're telling you to do. You know what we're going to discover? Even though Paul could have said, I don't got to do that. I don't got to do that to prove anything. Even though Paul could have said, who are you? I'm an apostle. You know what Paul did? He humbled himself and submitted himself to the biblical authority of the church. What humility. What humility. So what do they ask him to do? It says, we have four men who are under a vow. We'll talk about that vow in just a second. We want you to take them, purify yourself along with them at the temple, and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. And all will know that there's nothing to the things which they have been told about you, but that you yourself also walk orderly keeping the law. And verse 26 says, Paul took the man, and the next day, purifying himself, along with them, he went into the temple and gave notice of the completion of the days of purification until the sacrifice was offered for each one of them. Now, what is this vow these four guys had taken? Well, in the Bible, it's called a Nazarite vow. It's part of the Old Testament law. You can read about it in Numbers chapter 6. It was a temporary and voluntary vow that people took on occasion. There were some people in the Bible who were Nazarites for life, people like Samson and John the Baptist. But for most, it was a temporary vow that you would make. Now, it involved three things. Number one, you could not cut your hair during that time period. Number two, you could not eat or drink anything that came from the vine, anything associated with grapes. And number three, you could not touch a dead body, whether it was human or animal. So obviously you couldn't eat meat because that meat is a dead body, right? And, uh, and so they would take this vow. And at the end of the vow, they would have to go to the temple. They would shave their heads, offer their hair as a sacrifice, and make other sacrifices to end the vow. That was the custom. So here's what they encourage Paul to do. They say, Paul, we want you to do two things. Number one, we want you to go with these men as they near the completion of their vow and purify yourself. And number two, we want you to pay the expenses for them having their heads shaved and for all their sacrifices. Now, I want you to think about this. What sacrifices, if you went back and read number six, we don't have time to do that, but what sacrifices were required? Let me list them for you. If you took a Nazarite vow, at the end of your vow, you would shave your head, you would take the hair to the temple to offer your hair as a sacrifice, and you would also do this. You would bring one male lamb as a burnt offering, one female lamb as a sin offering, one ram as a peace offering, a basket of unleavened cakes along with a grain offering and a drink offering. Now just the meat, just the meat from those offerings could feed 100 people at a feast. It's expensive. Have you ever bought enough steak for 100 people? It's expensive. And in this case, there wasn't one person who took the vow, not two, not three, four people. This would be a massive expense. Paul could have said, time out, James. I got rights here. And I have the right to say no. I have the right to say forget that. I'm not doing that. But you know what Paul does? Paul does exactly what they told him to do. Paul puts the unity of the church 
the purity of the church above his own personal rights. He takes those guys to the front porch salon and has their head shaved. And then they go up to the temple and he pays for all those sacrifices. Did he have to do that? He had a right to say no. But he showed humility. Here was a man who on one hand could have a determination to obey God's will no matter what, but on the other hand was willing to show humility for the sake of the unity of the church. What an example. Because the truth is, folks, that today more than any time in the 36 years I've been a pastor, I see Christians who on a regular basis give more attention to their personal rights than they do the unity and purpose of the church. And I love that Apostle Paul said, I'll do it. I'll do it. And he shows his humility. And he shows his unity. Because you see, friends, this was Paul's philosophy. Look at 1 Corinthians 9. We'll wrap it up with this passage. 1 Corinthians 9. Paul says, though I'm free from all men, I've made myself a slave to all men. Why? So that I may win more people to Jesus. So to the Jews, I become like a Jew. So when I'm with the Jews, I don't eat bacon, right? When I'm with the Jews, I go by the Jewish customs. Why? So that I can win the Jews. I don't want to burn bridges. I want to build bridges. And to those who are under the law is under the law. Verse 21, to those who are without the law, the Gentiles, then I, if I'm with them, guess what? I eat bacon with them. Why? I don't want to burn bridges. I want to win them to Jesus. I want to build bridges. To the weak, I become weak. I become all things to all men so that by all means, some can be saved. And I do all things for the sake of the gospel. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the greatest things we can do is to sometimes sacrifice some rights so we can build bridges to people for Jesus. So on one hand, Paul had a determination. I will follow God's will, even if it means hardship, even if it goes against the advice of people who care about me. And on the other hand, I will show humility. I will put the unity and peace and purpose of the church above my own personal preferences and rights. And that's why I believe the Apostle Paul was an amazing man who God used like a pencil to do amazing things. Well, the Spawnables are going to take over down in the chapel. Jeff's going to take over right now up at the Sioux campus. And as the worship team gets in place here at the Gaylor campus, I want to remind you that this is Communion Sunday, which means it's Elder Fund Sunday. And at the doors as you leave, elders will be there. They'll have a tub for you to throw your cups in. They'll also have offering baskets. If you would like to give an offering to the Elder Fund, uh, that's used to help people in our church and in our community that have a need. And, uh, and so cash, check made out to the church. Anything that goes into those baskets at the door go to the Elder Fund. Your regular offerings can go in the giving boxes in the back of the auditoriums. Or, of course, you can give to the General Fund or Elder Fund online at any time. Would you stand with me? So, Father, I pray as we enter this new year, that the example of Paul would become our lives. That we would be determined to follow your will no matter what. And that we would be humble enough to be willing to sacrifice even our rights at times for the unity of the church. And I pray that in doing those things, we would be drawn over and over again to the fact that you are a good God, a God that will never let us down. 
So we worship you this morning for just that reason. In Jesus' name, amen.